Hey guys, it's Paul from Online Sax Academy. In today's lesson, we've got five amazing 251 licks from five different master saxophone players. It's a bit of a journey through jazz history as well, as we're going to do a journey from the earliest to the most recent, starting off in the 1930s with this guy over here, Lester Young. Now, the lick you can see up here, this is what he played at the end of his first chorus. Now, the full title of this track is Boogie Woogie, I May Be Wrong, and it's from a Count Basie and his orchestra track that was recorded in 1937, and it features this amazing solo by Lester Young. Now it's a 12 bar blues in C concert pitch which means it's a 12 bar blues in D for tenor sax and the notes you can see up here are in the tenor sax key. Now Lester Young is famous for being an amazingly lyrical and melodic player with an amazing sense of time as well. We'll listen to his solo from the beginning and then I'll tell you when we hit this lick. <laughs> Coming up now, here. All right, so that's the first chorus. Okay, let's have another listen to just that lick. Now there are two notes leading into this 251. On the tenor sax, he's playing F sharp to E, which on the piano is E and D. So we have this intro of, and then we're into the lick. Have a listen to it. All right, so if we look closely into this, you can see that he's hitting the fifth of E minor. E obviously is the first, F sharp the second. And then we end on this note here, the fourth, and that's a really nice note to finish on. So if we play that slowly, we get this sound. Interestingly, those four notes of E, F sharp, A, and B, those are all from the D major pentatonic. Lester Young's playing a blues in D, so it makes sense that he's gonna be using notes from a D major pentatonic scale. Now the next measure is amazing, and it's really all about this note here. This th is known as the 13th of A7. If we build a chord, we've got one, three, five, seven. There you can see we've got A7, nine, 11, that often doesn't get added, so we'll take that out. And then we've got the 13th here. And that 13th is a really nice color that often got used in swing styles of playing. It's this very bright kind of sound. And you can hear how that first part of the phrase really wants to come back to resolve back onto D, the home note, which is exactly what he does here, where this D is like an anticipation of this chord. And that 13 going back to the root is a really nice sound that you can play around with when you're improvising. Have another listen to the way Lester Young plays it. And then to finish off this phrase, we've got this nice balance of this kind of falling and rising shape where we're hitting the six, four, two, and then back up with our three, five, one. Now, one thing you should pay attention to when you're trying to pull apart a phrase and really see what makes it tick is have a look at like the main starting and end notes or the held notes. They're often the most important. And you can see how he's starting on the fifth of the chord here. In this measure, he's starting on the seventh of the chord. So both key chord tones. And then of course, he's coming back to this anticipated root note here. And then he again ends on the root note at the end. And you can take that idea of starting on the fifth of E minor, improvising around, heading your way to the 13th of the uh, A7, and then resolving to the root note of D major. You don't have to necessarily play the exact notes that are here, but you can take the kind of scaffolding of it to create your own lines. Now in the description below, I have a PDF for both alto and tenor saxes where I, for example, this lick is played on the tenor sax. I have it transposed for alto sax as well. I also have all of these licks kind of normalized into C major. That will allow you to really compare and contrast as we go through these different licks, you'll see what they're like in C major. And the link to that is just down below. Now the other thing to notice about this is there are no chromatic passing notes, meaning every single note he's playing here just comes from the overall scale of D major. So you can still create really nice and melodic phrases without necessarily having to really complicate them with loads of substitutions and chromatic passing notes and things. Now you'll see later on as we progress through with the other licks how those kinds of things start to get used, 
but it's always good to start with a really good foundation of just being able to improvise phrases diatonically, meaning no extra passing notes. All right, moving into the 1940s now, we've got this amazing 251 phrase played by Charlie Parker on the tune Billy's Bounce. Now this is one of Charlie Parker's most famous sax solos, particularly for the opening phrase in this solo, but we're gonna pick it up from the fourth chorus, which is where this lick appears. We're gonna go a few bars before to lead into it. Now even just looking at this phrase you can see there's kind of a lot more going on here but if you look at the second half of this phrase this could almost be something that Lester Young would play and Lester Young was a really big influence on Charlie Parker. It's completely diatonic, we've got no extra chromatic passing notes and he's not including things like the flat seventh or the flat three, he's just playing in the kind of key of D major and he's using a lot of chord tones here as well. You can see we immediately start on the third and then we just got these three number fives in a row. And then we're coming down here but again look at the notes that he's emphasizing, again he's emphasizing the third here and it's always good to look at the last note as well he's ending on the fifth so using those thirds and fifths to really outline the sound of that D major chord and ending on that A there, the fifth. So we can think of that second half of the phrase is like the release, the relaxed part of the phrase. It's fairly straightforward, it's diatonic, there's nothing too challenging in there. The first half of the phrase though is where there's a bit more tension and you can see that just visually by, you can see we've got these accidentals here like this D sharp and this C natural, notes that aren't in the key of D major because of course this is another two, five, one in the key of D. To understand it, we're gonna take it piece by piece. So if we look at this first bit here, and have a listen to this, we've got those are literally just the notes of our E minor chord we've got 1, 5, 3, 5, 3, 1 so he's literally just spelling out the chord of uh, E minor then for the second half, this is where we see the D sharp and you can see it's spelling out an E minor major 7 chord so we've got this sound of E minor falling to E minor major 7 which then immediately falls again to this D here, which we get this sound of. And then on the next beat, so on beat two, this is beat one, here's beat two, we get the C sharp. And the C natural before it is like a chromatic approach note or an enclosure. So we have this sound of E minor, then we get the D sharp, then the D and then the C sharp. And that's a really common kind of substitution you can use when you're on an E minor chord. So focus on that falling line of the E going to D sharp, going to D, going to C sharp through this line. And it's such an amazing phrase. So if I put some root notes down with this, we've got. You can hear how well that outlines the chords. So even though it looks like a fairly complicated phrase, there's a really clear logic through it. We've got this descending guide tone line going through of that E, D sharp, D to end on the C sharp on the A7. And then ending with that really nice, simple diatonic phrase to counterbalance that more intricate phrase is a really nice idea to try. So let's have another listen to this phrase. <laughs> All right, now moving into the 1950s, we've got Paul Desmond's amazing 251 phrase. This is on the tune Winter Song, and this was recorded in 1957, and it's a famous album that features both Paul Desmond and Jerry Mulligan on the baritone sax. Now, along with his amazing tone, Paul Desmond's famous for his really lyrical and very logical kind of lines that he plays. And you'll see what I mean when you hear the lead in to this amazing phrase. <laughs> So there's no piano. And then coming into the phrase.
All right, so straight away, just looking at the contour of this phrase, you can see kind of this is what I mean by how he's very logical and structured, his improvising. We've got this same kind of shape going up, and that's what gives it this kind of melodic quality to it. It allows your ear to follow the shape of the line, and you kind of start to build up expectations because you can hear the pattern of, oh, it's rising, and then it comes back down and rises again. And that's one of the things that can make things sound melodic is when there's an, an element of predictability ability to it so you kind of your ear starts to form expectations. Now in terms of the notes he's playing for the D minor chord he's just using the chord tones we've got a D and then what he's playing over the top is the three five seven and the nine and he's going up like that and so we've got this three five seven nine three five seven which is just a really nice shape. This is also the F major seven shape but when you put the D in the bass and then play that shape you get a D minor nine shape, which has this kind of floaty quality to it because of that ninth. And so those four notes of the three, five, seven, nine are a great kind of set of notes to improvise with when you're on a D minor seven chord. Now for this section here, this is where it gets really interesting because what he's outlining here is essentially, if I play those notes, you'll see the system is telling me that is an E major seven chord, now you can hear, if I put a G in the bass and then play those notes, they're pretty spicy. But this doesn't sound wrong because of the notes we've had beforehand. Because we had exactly the same shape, a semitone higher, then when we slide down, it kind of puts it in context. Also, the notes of E, G sharp and B, these three here, that makes our E major triad. And those three notes just as a triad are a really nice sound to play on a G7 chord. You can see it creates here what's called a G13 flat 9, which sounds complicated. So we've got our G7 chord here and the E is the 13th. A bit like in that first Lester Young phrase where he was emphasising the 13th. We've also got the flat 9 in there as well, which adds this really nice uh, flat nine quality to the chord. Now the thing that makes this really spicy is that note D sharp, because that's actually the flat 13, that D sharp, or sharp five, you can think of it like that. And it's very rare to have the natural 13 and the flat 13, because we get this kind of chord, which just kind of sounds a bit wrong, but it doesn't sound wrong in context here for a couple of reasons. First of all, there's no piano player, which gives you a lot more space to explore these kind of more interesting harmonic ideas. And, and mostly it's because he set it up with the phrase before with that F major seven shape, which then lets our ears sink into that E major seven shape without it just sounding like really weird and wrong. Now you can see the original transcription of this is like a short two five one, meaning the two and the five chord are in the first measure. I've also written this out as a long two five one as well. So basically what I've done is doubled all of these note lengths. So this first note here, instead of being an eighth note, it's a quarter note. And then instead of all these sixteenths, they then double to become eighth notes. So you can kind of see what this phrase would look like in a long two five one format as well. Now now, along with all of these 251 phrases all being transposed into C major, premium members at Online Sax Academy can also download all of these phrases in all 12 keys. And I've organized it so that each sheet is for one particular key. And we've also got a 14 day free trial at Online Sax Academy, so you can sign up and check out all the other content. Moving into the 1960s now, we've got this amazing phrase by Dexter Gordon. And this is from the tune Love For Sale on the Incredible Go album. If you haven't checked that out yet, I'd really recommend it. It's one of my favorites. Dexter Gordon is another incredibly lyrical and melodic player, but he's more from the hard bop kind of school of playing. And Dexter Gordon's one of those players that are great to transcribe because everything he plays is just so clear and melodic and you can really see what's going on in the phrase and learn so much from it. So in this phrase, it's a two, five, one. We're in the key of B flat major now on the tenor sax. Again, you've got this in C major as well in the PDF, but this is how he would have played it on the tenor sax. So let's check out the phrase. Now 
is so good. All right, so if we take it measure by measure, you can see we're just climbing up that C minor scale, first of all. Now, crucially, we're missing out the sixth. We're not playing that A. We're saving that A, which is the third of F7 when we get into that next measure. And that's a really common technique. We're gonna step over the A and then land on it as we hit the F7 chord. And so that's a really great technique you can start to play around with in your solos. It's really effective at outlining that chord change. Then you can see we're walking down to the next strong beat, beat three. You can see we've got this E flat, which is another really important chord tone. It's the seventh of F7, so we've got this stepping down. And then we've got this approach up into the third of B flat major seven. That D is held over the bar line and it's the third of our B flat major seven chord. Now when you take a step back and look at this, there's only one chromatic passing note in this whole thing. So it's kind of similar all the way back to the Lester Young phrase in that this is very diatonic. But what makes it sound so good and make it not sound like he's just running up and down a B flat major scale is that on the strong beats of the bar, beats one and three, he's always hitting a chord tone. And that's what really kind of makes it sync up with those chords that are going on. We've got the one and the three in the C minor bar. Then we've got that third and seventh in the uh, F7 bar. And then again, we've got the third and then later he finishes here on the one. So the one, the three and the seventh are the most common chord tones. The fifth is good as well, but the first, third and seventh are really strong chord tones to try to anchor your phrases to. Now, if we play this through, I'm just gonna use half notes and I'm just gonna play those notes that are on beat one and three. You can hear how it creates a nice melody. We've got C, E flat and then A, E flat, which floats down to D, and B flat in the B flat major seven. So when you're trying to play around with your lines, you can start with your chord tones and then see if you can start to connect from chord tone to chord tone using just notes from the major scale. This you know, basically all notes from the B flat major scale. And I would encourage you to really get a strong grasp of that first before you start chucking in loads of uh, chromatic passing notes and enclosures and substitutions, etc. All right, finishing off today, we've got this amazing 251 phrase by Michael Brecker. Now this is from a 1980 one recording of him playing confirmation with Chick Corea. Check out this phrase. All right, so what I'm gonna do is slow this down a little bit and then I'm gonna accompany him. I'm gonna play some chords behind because there's no bass or piano on the recording. Um, you'll be able to really hear the notes and tensions that he's using a lot clearer. All right, so we'll get into it. You'll see this phrase isn't as scary as it first looks. You can see we've got this first little three note shape here, which also kind of gets copied up one here. So we've got, and then, basically how you can think of this is we've got the pair of notes E and G, and we're just approaching it from one semitone below. We're thinking like we're in C major here. So, and then we go up to the next third. And in theory, you could keep going. And those kind of patterns are really useful to practice. What he does here though is continue on with, these are the same notes that Paul Desmond was using. He's using that three, five, seven, and nine on the D minor chord. And so here we've got those same notes of the F major seven, but when you put the D in the bass, you get that really nice D minor nine sound. And he's holding on to that really nice floaty ninth sound as we get to the top of the chord there. Now, as we look into the G7 chord, there's a bit more going on here. Again, you should generally tend to look at what's happening on beat one and three, the strong beats of the bar, as they'll often give you clues as to what he's kind of thinking when he's playing. So C sharp, that's actually known as the sharp 11 of a G7 chord. So we've got our G7 chord. And then we've got this kind of floaty uh, sharp 11 sound. And then this B flat is also known as the sharp nine sound. So he's really thinking kind of what's known as the altered scale here. So in this case, we're thinking A flat minor, but starting on G. And that creates lots of really interesting tensions. How we get into this C sharp, you can see we're falling chromatically. We were holding that high E on the D minor chord and then we're just falling 
like that, going down two chromatic notes and they're sixteenth notes as well. So really you can think of it just like a full. Now for this section here you can think of this as like an enclosure. We're landing on G which is the fifth of C major and we're just approaching it from just a semitone below, scale tone above and then we hit the main note. And for the rest of that C major seven measure it's just all notes that can be found in the C major pentatonic scale. Now the important thing is how he's using the tensions. You can see all the tension is happening here. This is where we've got all those interesting sharp 11s and sharp 9s. For the first measure, he's basically inside the chord. We're really outlining the chord tones with that 3, 5, 7 and 9 on the D minor. And then again at the end, we're also playing inside again, just playing purely diatonic notes with that C major. Now this structure of playing inside the chord changes using lots of tension on the five chord here in this case G7 and then coming back inside again on the one chord. That's a great way to start to structure your lines if you want to use some of these more outside and more tense notes. Okay, so now don't forget to get your free PDF that has all of these phrases in their original key and in C major. And do check out the 14 day free trial, which will give you access to absolutely everything on the site, including all the courses like the Learn to Improvise course, which will step you through from the very beginning of learning how to improvise all the way up to the kind of concepts we're talking about in this lesson. If you're new to the channel, hit subscribe so you don't miss out on future lessons and I'll see you guys soon.